Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, welcome to today's um, talk in the Silk Road A Living History series. Um, the talk today is entitled The Palmyri House, a case study of Silk Road dwellings on the roof of the world. My name is Salima Bhatia and I um, work at the Institute of Ismaili Studies and it gives me great pleasure to moderate um, this afternoon's talk. Uh, the talk is being delivered by my colleague, Dr. Nurma Machor Nurma Machorev from the Institute of Ismaili Studies. It's part of a series of talks which are complementing the Aga Khan Foundation UK's current outdoor exhibition in Granary Square in King's Cross, London. Um, the exhibition is entitled The Silk Road, A Living History. And if you haven't seen uh, the exhibition, those of you who are based uh, in London, I urge you to do so. This is its final week. Um, it's an open air photography exhibition by travel photographer Christopher Wilton Steer, and it documents Christopher's journey along the historic trade route when he traveled 40,000 kilometers overland by car, bus, train, ferry, horse, and camel from London to Beijing and he traversed 16 countries uh, along the Silk Road. Um, the exhibition invites the viewer to take this journey as well from London to Beijing and you encounter many of the people, the places and the cultures along the ancient uh, trade route. Um, you'll see there are over 160 photographs um, from Iran, from Turkmenistan, from Uzbekistan, from Tajikistan, from Kyrgyzstan and uh, Pakistan, India, China and elsewhere. And the exhibition really aims to celebrate the diversity um, of cultural expressions that you find along the Silk Road um, and to highlight examples of how historical practices, rituals and customs live on today. And it also seeks to engender interest and understanding between distant cultures and to challenge some of our perceptions of lesser well-known um, and understood parts of the world. So coming back to today's talk by Dr. Nur Mamadshur Nur Mamadshur, um, this will focus on places of dwelling along the Silk Road with a special focus on the Palmyri house. Um, in local Palmyri languages, this is known as Chid. Um, the traditional Palmyri house um, as an everyday living space um, and Dr. Noor Mohamed Shorev will uh, look at the ritualistic as well as symbolic worldview and how uh, this is embodied in the Palmyri house, in the architecture. It's a type of uh, traditional house which is prevalent in Badakhshan in Tajikistan and in Afghanistan, as well as the northern areas of modern Pakistan. Um, and the Palmyri house has a long history and um, it reflects pre-Islamic as well as Islamic cosmological worldviews of the inhabitants of Badakhshan. And in this presentation, Dr. Norma Machura will talk about the architectural design of the Palmyri house and will explain the symbolic meaning of various elements and features of the Palmyri house. Uh, just to introduce um, my colleague to you with his uh, bio, uh, Norma Machura, Norma Machura is a research associate and projects coordinator at the Ismaili Special Collections Unit at the Institute of Ismaili Studies. He received his BA in Oriental Studies in Arabic and Persian Languages and Literature from Khorog State University in Tajikistan in 1997. In 2002, he was offered a place on the two-year graduate program in Islamic Studies and Humanities at the Institute of Ismaili Studies in London. Noor Mamadshaw then joined the Oriental Studies Department at the University of Cambridge, where he received an MPhil in Middle Eastern and Islamic Studies. And in 2005, he was um, awarded an IIS doctoral scholarship to pursue his PhD at the Department of History at SOAS, um, which he successfully completed in 2014. Noor Mamadshaw is currently converting his PhD thesis into a monograph and writing articles entitled Shah Hamoush and the Story of Arrival, and Schisms and Their Effect on the Ismaili Communities of Badakhshan. Uh, Noor, if I can invite you uh, to turn your camera on, and I just want to say uh, personally, it, it, you know, we've known each other since you came to London in 2002 as a younger graduate student, and it, so that's why it really personally gives me great pleasure 
to introduce you and to be moderating this talk today. It's also a little bit of a trip down memory lane for me for another reason. I had the unique uh, experience of staying in a Palmyra house when I was in Badakhshan in 1998, um, undertaking some field work. And um, so I'm really going to enjoy recollecting this as you take us through this visual experience today. You're actually joining us today from Moscow. And I think we're in for a real treat because you're actually in a prototype uh, Palmyra house in uh, Moscow to deliver um, your talk. And, and for that, we have to thank uh, the charity called Save Me Mother, uh, which is founded by a Badakhshani uh, Ismaili who lives in Moscow. Um, and thank all the staff and volunteers um, who've helped facilitate um, and, and help you to be able to deliver your talk from uh, inside the Palmyra house uh, today. Um, I'd like to also, uh, both of us would like to dedicate today's uh, talk in the memory of a fellow uh, student from the Institute of Ismaili Studies who passed away a couple of weeks ago, uh, Sultan Yaz Khojan Yazov, uh, also affectionately known as Sash, um, and we'd like to dedicate today's talk uh, in his memory. Nora, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Salima for the uh, wonderful uh, introduction. And it brings a long memory of my visit, first visit to the United Kingdom when you helped us with uh, settling down in, in London. Uh, so today's presentation, as, as you mentioned, is about the Pamiri House. Uh, and first of all, I would like to thank uh, the Aga Khan Foundation in the UK, particularly Christopher Wilton Steer, who organized these, uh, these sessions and invited me to present uh, my talk about the Pamiri House as a case study. And also my thanks to my colleagues at the Institute of Smiley Studies and uh, the uh, volunteers in, the, um, in Moscow who facilitated today's um, uh, presentation. Uh, um, and without uh, further ado, I will proceed with the uh, discussion. And the, good, the topic of... Uh, uh, as you can see, the uh, Silk Road is expanded from China all the way to the Roman Empire or to the modern Europe and trespassing uh, through the Himalayas and particularly the regions of Badakhshan. And we have recollection from different historical sources, particularly from Marco Polo when he talks about different places in Shugnan in, in the Badakhshan region and then uh, uh, different other, other historical accounts where we find uh, references to, to, to the region of Badakhshan. So the Pamiri house is, is called Chid in the Shogni language. And this is a prevalent uh, architectural design uh, where people of, of uh, different uh, uh, parts of modern Afghanistan, the Northern area of Pakistan and East Turkestan is living. Uh, so in the in this map you can see that the region of uh, of Shognan, Wakhan, uh, uh, Goron, Zibak, northern areas of Pakistan, which is located in 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 this part, and the eastern Turkestan, where the modern uh, Xinjiang province is located, uh, some uh, Isma Ismailis and uh, Tajiks uh, built the Pamiri house in that part of the world. The Pamiri house is the embodiment and uh, of the worldview of the local population, particularly how they looked at, the, uh, at, the, at their surrounding and expressed their views about their attachment to the places. So as we can say, many of our greatest architectural achievements were designed to reflect promises of life hereafter, to represent in this world what we are told in the, uh, to be in the next. Since all that we see and resonate on the faith, the aesthetics of environment we built and the quality of the social interactions that take within those environments reverberate on our spiritual life. This is what uh, His Highness uh, mentioned in one of his speech on September uh, 25th, uh, 1976 um, in his talk. So the Pamiri house is also uh, 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 in architectural design that shows the uh, worldview of people and how they, uh, they reflected on their living environment, which I will show you in detail 
from the prototype of the family house in the in Moscow. This is very uh, interesting part where the, in the older days we had family house built only in the mountainous regions of Badakhshan, where the Ismailis and they resided. In the modern world, where the community is dispersed throughout the world, now we have the, either the prototype of the family house or the actual family house built in St. Petersburg in Russia and in uh, two or three houses in Moscow. The place where I'm sitting now is a prototype of the family house, which is very small in size, and some of the architectural parts are left out due to the space constraint, uh, which I will show you in a couple of minutes. So normally the family house, due to the environment, to the hard, due to harsh and difficult environment of the mountainous region, is built on different places, uh, particularly on the hills or uh, near uh, the, the uh, rivers and the, in different valleys. Uh, so this is one example where you can see the family house is built on the hill, and the size of the house, as you can see, is not very big. In the house, Pamirichi, that I'm currently sitting, the size is five, five into four, which gives us the total of 220 square meters only. only. This is another example of the Pamiri house, which is built uh, next to the mountains, to the, uh, to the mountains. And as you can see, the house has some other components where the, uh, the cattle uh, and the animals are kept as well. As we look at the historical dwellings along the Silk Road, we can recall many other types of architectural design that were used by people living in, in parts uh, uh, which are currently in Afghanistan, in Tajikistan, in Kyrgyzstan, and then all the way to Iran and other, other parts of, the, uh, of Central Asia. Another example of the dwellings that we can show you here is the uh, Kyrgyz yurt, which is built um, since the, the, the Kyrgyz people were mostly nomadic people and moving in, uh, uh, in different seasons to different parts of the world. The yurt is a, a construction which was taken by the people with them, and they constructed and put it in place where the, the cattle could, could be, uh, where the pasture were greener and the water was closer to the people. As you can see, these are the Kyrgyz people uh, in the step building the yurt, and the inside of the yurt looks like this, where the, uh, the space is not that big, but it contains uh, a number of family, one or two families, so that they could live properly. In the Pamiri house, we have the same construction because the, we have one big house, which is divided into several components. And then I will, in, in, in my talk, show you the different, uh, different parts of the primary house and explain the symbolic meaning of each component as well. As I mentioned, the primary house is um, prevalent in different parts of the uh, Central Asia. And this particular house, as you can see, it's a traditional primary house which was built in the Yasin Valley of Gilgit in Baltistan, which is uh, in, in modern northern area of Pakistan. Uh, so the design of the traditional primary house uh, can be divided into to, into five components, and, uh, and my assistant will uh, currently show you the. Uh, yeah. So. Thank you. So the, the three parts are called the Sanj. Uh, so the, 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 the Sanj, these are, these are the three Sanj. Uh, these are three elevations which are made, uh, which are made uh, for comfortably sitting in the house. Then we have five uh, Panj Sitan, which are called the five pillars. And then we have uh, two woos. Uh, uh, th these are two long beams. And then uh, the shorter beams are holding the roof of the house. And then the chorhona, which I will show you in, in detail in a couple of minutes. So the same sign that you currently see on, on your screen, these are the representation of the, uh, is the creation, basically, 
in, in the traditional understanding worldview of the Pamiri people, the three sound represents the world of animals, the world, world of uh, uh, plants and the world of human being. So that's the reason that in the Pamiri house, they created this three sanj, three elevation, where the for the comfortable uh, of people, uh, they could use it as a, as a chair as well for seating seating purposes. However, they have um, uh, uh, kind of re religious significance as well. Uh, the Panj Setan, we start from the uh, the main beam. This is the main beam, which is called Shosatun in the Pamiri, uh, in the Shogni language. The Shosatun is also called in, in, in the pre-Islamic tradition, it is called Surush. It represents the one of the uh, one of the angels that, that was uh, the, the helper of Ahura Mazda. In the Islamic period, when the uh, traditional Islamic teaching uh, came to this part of the world, the Shosatun was changed into the to represent the figure of the Prophet Muhammad. In the design of the Pamiri house, as you can see, this is one uh, one pillar which holds the major part of the roof, uh, and then the, uh, major part of the roof. The next uh, pillar that you can see, uh, this is called Vosnech uh, Setan in the in the Pamiri language in the Shogni languages. In the pre-modern time, in the um, pre-Islamic period. This was represented by, by, by an angel called Mer. So the second uh, uh, pillar that you can see, this is called uh, Mer in the pre-Islamic tradition. And in the Islamic tradition, it was represented by the figure of Imam Ali, uh, as the uh, 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 Imam Ali, who was the cousin in, uh, of the uh, Prophet Muhammad and the son of, of the Prophet Muhammad. The next uh, pillar that you can see, which is called the, uh, this is called Kitsor Setan. Kitsor is basically the place where the fireplace is uh, located. And you can see the fireplace, the replica of the fireplace uh, here as well. So the Kitsor Setan is represented by the Anahita in the pre-Islamic tradition. In the Islamic tradition, it was uh, the representation of the uh, Prophet Muhammad's daughter, uh, Fatima. Uh, and the two other pillars that you can see, these are connected between them with, the, with, with this uh, uh, design, small design uh, parts, which is called Bujkigij. And in the traditional, uh, in the pre-Islamic time, these, these, these are represented. One is represented by Zamyod, uh, and which was uh, changed into the Imam Hassan. And the, the next one on this side, the one that I'm pointing to, this is called uh, the, re represented the, uh, the angel of Ozar. Or in the Islamic tradition, this is called, uh, represents the, uh, son of uh, the second son of Imam Ali, Imam Hussein. The middle part where you can see the engraving, the engraving this uh, the, that uh, is attached between these two pillars. This is uh, the reflection uh, represents the uh, the connection between Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein, with only differences that the uh, this pillar, the the pillar of Imam Hassan in the traditional Pamiri house used to be much shorter. Uh, that shows that the Imam Hassan was the, uh, not the uh, Imam Mustakhar as, uh, as it is uh, known in the Ismaili tradition. Apart from this, as we can see, these five pillars that, uh, that hold the roof of the entire house, they have the pre-Islamic and Islamic representation and then on the top of each pillar, uh, we have two different beams. So as you can see, this long beam that goes all the way from, can move a little bit slowly? Yeah. So this long beam is called Wus. 
groups. So in the pre-Islamic tradition, uh, the local population used to call this uh, one of these beam as a minu, which was the representation of the mm, spiritual world. And in the opposite to this, the same beam uh, on this side, opposite to this on this side is another, the same type of long beam, which is called uh, in the pre-Islamic time, it was called geti. And it, it was represented by the uh, material world, world as such. In the Islamic tradition, we can have now the confluence of the uh, um, uh, Neoplatonic philosophy and then the Ismaili teaching, whereby the, the uh, one of the beams is represented by the universal uh, intellect, and the second was, one is represented by universal soul, which is exactly the represent the representation of the material world and then uh, uh, the spiritual world of the pre-Islamic tradition. So above each of the nech, above each of these two nechs, uh, we have the pillars, uh, shorter beams. These are shorter beams which, which are divided into uh, since this is a uh, prototype of a Pamiri house, we have only six of these in place, uh, which are represented in the Islamic tradition by, uh, by six prophets, starting from Adam, Ibrahim, uh, Prophet Isa, Musa, and then uh, Muhammad. Uh, and also uh, Muhammad. On the other side, we have uh, on the above the fireplace we in the traditional house we used to have seven of these uh, beams unfortunately in the prototype due to the space con constraint we have only two of these shorter beams uh, which is due to the uh, space constraints but in the traditional primary house we have them seven and they represent the different layers uh, in the smiley tradition starting from the imam uh, all the way to Mustajib, um, uh, into Mustajib. The next part of the Pamiri house, as you can see, this is the called Chorhona or four, four if we uh, translate it uh, the, uh, verbatim, it gives the meaning of the four houses. The, uh, um, and it represents four different uh, uh, lay layers uh, which is exactly the same in the pre-Islamic tradition and Islamic tradition, which is the representation of the water, air, uh, fire, and then the wind, which uh, be become the representation of the, uh, of the world as such. So the last part on the, uh, on the four, layers that you can see it represents the uh, the the sky the sky is kind of an open space in the traditional pamiri house this is called rausana or or, or roads whereby the the lighting from the outside is fetched in into the house so that the lighting uh, you uh, so that it lights the, lights the, the premise uh, however as you can see, the uh, it is above the uh, uh, the, the the last point uh, that uh, points towards the heaven, uh, and then the Pamiri people are of uh, in the historical period uh, used to not to build a house for for the for the God, uh, and then God is in their understanding is beyond everything. That's why the uh, the the top of the house that bring light into the house is the representation of the light of God. So the different type of utensils that we currently see in the house, uh, these are the traditional utensils that used to be in in, in the, used to be by by different uh, uh, by people of Pamir in different times. So as the, uh, historically it was uh, kind of, the, the area was isolated. It was very difficult for people to, uh, 
Uh, the, the house was the contain, contained the extended family and the number of people living in the house exceeded in some cases um, uh, more than 15 people. So in light of this, as you can see, the different type of utensils are used for eating meal together or sharing food together in one place. Uh, apart from this, you can see uh, different traditional musical instruments in the house as well, which used to be in place uh, uh, in the all the time and we can have the the actual representation of these uh, musical instruments as the one that you can, can see on the top is called daf uh, uh, the uh, daf and then the rubob the traditional rubob which is used for singing traditional uh, didactic music in praise of the prophet muhammad and the uh, the, the family uh, the family of the prophet muhammad the place that you can see from this side uh, is called in the historical period, uh, it is called the, uh, the Sajoda. Sajoda is the, the place where this is the place usually where the Khalifa and the representation of, of the religious uh, the hierarchy used, used to see. Particularly, the Sajoda was a place for the peer, for the Ismaili peer who was teaching people about the, uh, the tr traditional Ismaili teaching. Uh, so for the religious function, it used to be the place of the Khalifa and for any other, uh, like for wedding, exactly this space was used for the Khalifa as well. On the other side of the house, you can see the uh, the place uh, which which is next to the uh, cradle. This is the space where you, uh, the bride and groom, uh, uh, this is the place of bride and groom during the wedding. And uh, the before uh, leaving the house, the, the groom usually uh, is, uh, he's, he's, uh, Attire is put on him in this place, and then he leaves for 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 the groom. And when they come back, this is the place where they, they will see. Um, apart from this, we have some of the traditional jurabs on the wall, which represents uh, the tr traditional historical uh, attire that the people of Badakhshan uh, used for their daily life. This is the traditional uh, socks, and then the traditional uh, 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 shoes, which are prepared from the uh, from uh, leather, uh, from leather, and also you can see different types of musical instrument on that side as well. Um, and I think that's that's it. Mainly, this is the uh, the, uh, the the most details of the Pamiri house that you could see in the presentation. Um, on top of uh, there, you can see the traditional uh, skull caps, the, which is Turkey in diff different colors, uh, which are currently used. We can see the, the, the smaller one, the smaller skull cap, caps from the Wakhan region, and the bigger one are from the, uh, from the Shugnan region of the modern Badakhshan of Tajikistan. Unfortunately, we do not have any items uh, or traditional items from the Afghan Badakhshan, uh, which we, we could not showcase in this presentation, uh, unfortunately. Yeah, this is the uh, beginning that I talked about these three sanj, uh, which are the elevation where people used to sit in the historical time and even in the modern time as well. And then you can see here the the number of beams above the fireplaces more. In the modern Pamiri house, as you can see, the fireplace is not here anymore because the, the kitchen is built in a different place. And then the fireplace is basically a symbolic setting only. Uh, and we do not have the fireplace anymore inside the Pamiri house. And that's it. Thank you. Um, I, um, I, there are a few questions certainly that I have and I invite our audience to also 
just um, put some questions in the um, Q&A. Um, before we start with that, Nora, I'm just wondering if both you and I turn our cameras off and we just have the laptop, um, the mobile camera moving. There are some people who missed um, seeing around the house. So if we could just spend a minute um, just focusing on the roof yeah. and a couple of other features, I'll turn mine off too. Yeah, so as I mentioned, this is the main pillar. This is called Shosetun. Yeah. And the bottom part that you can see, this is called Sanj. Sanj is the elevation where it is used for seating. And these uh, Sanj are three of them in, the, in every primary house. So this is the second pillar. Uh, which represents in, in the Islamic tradition the uh, figure of Imam Ali. Okay. This is the fourth uh, pillar. And in the Islamic tradition, it represents the figure of uh, Fatima, the daughter of the Prophet Muhammad and the wife of Imam Ali. Uh, the next one is, these are two pillars that you can see next to each other. These are the representation of Imam Hassan and Hussain. And the middle part that connects them, this is called Buchkirich. And then you can see the traditional engraving of them. And then these engravings are changed uh, in the modern times. But if you can see the attire, the traditional attire behind, the same type of in, uh, symbolic is used on the attire and on the Pamiri uh, skull cap as well. What are the symbols? Which used, uh, these in the, uh, the pre-Islamic tradition, they call it swastika. Uh, it is the, uh, it show, it explains the life, kind of the, the rotation of life and rotation of season. And then we can see it even in the modern publication in the books as well. Yeah. So the next part that I mentioned, these are usually on this part, we have shorter beams, which are normally six, and they represent these uh, this six prophets, starting from Prophet Adam, ending with Prophet Muhammad in the Islamic tradition. And on the other side, we used to have seven of these beams, but due to the space con constraint, unfortunately, the number of beams on this side are three only. Thank you very much, uh, Noor, and thank you to all of your colleagues there at Save Me Mother um, Charity. Um, it's really, I think, made, made the talk a kind of very vibrant, dynamic um, experience, being able to be situated in an actual uh, Palmieri House. So thank, please thank them all uh, on our behalf. Um, to our viewers, our audience, um, thank you as well for joining us uh, today for this insight into the Palmieri House. Please don't forget that the Silk Road uh, Living History Exhibition is still on for this is its last week. It closes um, on Sunday. Um, so please do visit it. You can also view the exhibition. There's an online version um, if you just look for silkroadlivinghistory.org. Um, and you know the, the exhibition has had a really great 19-week uh, run. It opened at the beginning of April. And my understanding is that it's moving to other cities in North America and Europe. Um, and there'll be more information on this um, through the Aga Khan Foundation in, in weeks to come. Um, there are still a couple of uh, more events and talks. So please visit the Silk Road Living History website uh, to sign up for um, artist Shosh Saleh is um, uh, conducting a particip participatory flat weaving kilim uh, workshop. So if you're interested in weaving, um, that is called Weaving Paradise, and that's on, on the 28th of August. Um, you can still also book tickets uh, for the free exhibition at the Aga Khan Center Gallery, Making Paradise, Exploring the Concept of Eden in Islamic Art and Garden Design, which runs until the end of September, please visit the Aga Khan Center website um, 
for booking uh, a, a ticket to this free exhibition. Um, and uh, from both of us, um, Nora, again, thank you uh, for your time, for joining us from Moscow. And um, it was a really fascinating uh, lunchtime talk. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Salima, and my thanks to Sushil. And also, I would like to thank Memon Shom, Memon Shom, the president of the charity organization that kindly allowed me to use the space for this talk, and for the administrator, Lim Shoyev Orif Shaw, who not only facilitated the talk, but he managed within three hours to install new internet connection <laughs> in the house so that the, the talk goes uh, smoothly. Thank Very you to good. everyone, and thanks to my partner and my friend. Uh, Elvira Jumabaeva, who was uh, showing you the house while I was talking about the uh, different parts of the house. That was fascinating. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Good afternoon, everybody. Bye bye. Bye bye.